know some some women are really excited upset that we took the selfie mirror out of the bathroom this morning. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, but we, we're, doing, we're doing a series titled Reflections, and I, and I figured what better mirror to use than the infamous ladies' room selfie mirror. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. Anybody excited for the word this morning? Amen. 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 I um, I take the train and the bus every morning, and in the bus that I take, there's a there's a section that you can't stand because the door opens, and if you stand there, the the door will push you, and and the train the bus gets really crowded in the mornings, and so. I normally stand right there because I like to be able to just get out, and I don't want a lot of people, you know, having to hit me all day, you know, the whole trip. And so people normally see me in that space, and, and there's a little space in front of me, and so they try to push because they want you to get into the space. And sometimes I got to say, yo, we can't stand here because the door opens. You understand? It'll hit your toes, right? So I just set that up for this quote this morning. <laughs> If the word of God steps on your toes today, it might be that you're standing in the wrong place. Hold up, hold up. (laughs) Father, we just ask for your anointing on your word, Lord. We thank you that your word is already anointed. So anoint the speaker, anoint the hearer, Lord God. Prepare us. Father, grant us today a true understanding of the greatness of your love as well as the responsibility and the weight of your calling in Jesus name amen amen can we believe it's almost the end of February already did somebody hit fast forward it's just things moving and moving quickly amen we, we started our beginning of the year challenge, and we've been talking about do-overs and resets, and another month has passed by almost. And I don't know about you, but in my life, it feels like things have been speeding up. In, in January, I had another birthday, and I was 40 again. <laughs> For the eighth time. For the eighth time. Things are moving fast, man, and we got so many things, you know, happening with the church building, with people's lives, and so when I ask God for a word for the year, the word that God gave me this year is pause. Pause. And I'm learning to love that word. Uh, Pause doesn't mean stop for good. Pause doesn't mean don't do anything. Pause doesn't give you an excuse to be inactive. Pause, by definition, is a temporary stop in action or speech. I mean, you know, sometimes you got to stop and stay still. And sometimes you got to shut up. Amen? Unfortunately for you, this is not one of those times for me to shut up. And so I'm reminded of my word for the year everywhere I look. You know, when, when you choose a word for the year, it's everywhere, right? It's like, like buses pass by, it's pause. You know, every commercial says pause. Every, everything I read is pause. And that, that word comes out everywhere. And, and so I'm constantly reminded throughout the day. I love it because every time I see it or hear it, I'm reminded that I need to pause for a second and listen for God. I need to pause and connect with God. In case you haven't heard about this word of the year thing because maybe you're new to us or, or maybe you just haven't been paying attention because we've been talking about it all year. Instead of making New Year's resolutions at this church, we like to take a time to pray, to ask God to give us one word for the year. And there's no theology in that. There's no magic in that. It's just amazing. It's something that we've done for a few years now, and God has really used it to grow, to grow us. Amen? How, how many of you have done it? Right? All right. Good. Three of us. Amen? It's amazing how God could use one word to shape you for an entire year. So listen, if you're new to us, if you haven't done it, you haven't been paying attention, you just woke up today, February 21st, good morning. Um, ask God today. Tell God, I need a word from you. I want not a good word. I want a God word. 
And I believe that today you'll receive it, you'll hear it today. God will, God will, God will give it to you and God will uh, uh, confirm it and confirm it. And before you leave here, that word will already be buzzing in your head. I believe that. Amen? Just say, God, give it to me. I want to hear it and, and then receive it. Remember, you don't want a good word. You want a God word. Right? I wanted a good word. I wanted something like authority, power. I wanted flow so I could be like the flow minator and the flow master and the flow. Anyway. But, but, you know, I want, God gives you a God word. And so the, the word is helping me, what, what it's helping me to do is really simple. It reminds me to take moments throughout the day to pause and listen for God. To pause and check in and make sure that I'm still connected to God. You know how sometimes you take a long trip and you're driving and you're listening to a station and you drive, you go too far and that station starts to drop out? And it starts to get staticky, and you're mad because that always happens at your favorite song. You're like, no! And, and so you, you have to tune in to, you have to tune in to get a signal again. Come on. You have to tune in. You have to try to fine tune and, 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 so, and, and, and get a signal. And for me, with the church and with church people and with my job and with job people and with hours and travel and people pushing you on a train and pushing you on a bus, it's easy to lose connection sometimes. Amen? Anybody or just, just me? It's easy to lose connection and pick up a lot of static. And then sometimes all you're listening to is the static of the world. The complaining, the bickering, the, the nonsense, and it's all static. Anybody go through a whole week where you realize, man, I heard nothing but static this week. Thank God it's Sunday and I could get back in church and, and tune in again and I could hear something from God today. Amen. But, but listen, that's not a good thing. We need to, we can't go from week to week. We can't go from Sunday to Sunday. This, this is not enough. We need to connect during the week. Amen. Because if you're not paying attention, you could travel for miles. You could go for weeks and months and realize that you lost your connection. And so God is teaching me with this word to pause once a day, to pause many times a day. Pause and see what God is doing here. Pause and see and ask, you know, how is God leading? Sometimes I got to pause and ask for directions. Sometimes I got to pause and ask for instruction. Sometimes even, even with, you could, how many know, you could read the word and still not get anything sometimes. And so you need to pause and ask for revelation. Ask for God's light, you know? And so I have to pause and check in, tune, and, and get myself to where the connection is stronger. Can you hear me now? Amen? You with me? Somebody needed to hear that today. That's why this is in there. It has nothing to do with the message. But if all you're hearing is static, then maybe you've gone too far. You might need to move from where you're standing. Amen? You need to get reconnected. I'm not saying pause is your word, but I'm telling you that's a good practice for all of us during the day, for the week, for the year. Amen? And so, okay, so because of that word, since our challenge, I've been very reflective. And, and I've just been, the word reflection has been something that's been on my mind. And see, when, when you pause, you notice things that you might not have noticed before or that you might not have paid much attention to before. Not this past Wednesday, but the one before. How many of you know it was Ash Wednesday? How many of you noticed that? Now, if you grew up in Catholic school, you know all about that. But depending on where you work or, or who you work with, you might have noticed a lot of people with black smudges on their forehead. Anybody? You guys notice that? And, and, and some, you know, with black crosses. And I saw it all day in the city. I saw it on the subways. I saw it on the bus. I saw it some of my coworkers. And, and, and I haven't been able to get that, that picture out of my mind. You know, it, I mean, that looks crazy right there. Right? right, That looks like scary. Scary crazy. But, but for, that, for this time, you know, I haven't been able to get that picture because the thought that so many people walked around marked for what they believed in. Walked around all day, marked men and women. For one day, it was obvious to everyone that looked at them that these people were part of some kind of religion, that these people were believers in something, right? Now, in the news lately, the other thing that we hear besides all the Trump nonsense is, is terrorism, right? 
And, and we've been hearing about all these terrorists. And a while back, we saw the terrorists were marking in, in Iraq and in different places. They were marking Christian homes with the Arabic N, which stands for Nazarene. Can we? This mark. And, 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 and shortly after that, you know, on Facebook, all the Christians started taking that mark and making it their profile. Do you remember this happened a little while back? And everybody had that as their profile. And so for a season, for a few moments in history, they were marked as believers. That meant that you were a believer. You believed in Jesus from Nazareth, the Nazarene. So for a moment in history, those people were marked. And then I started thinking, what would it look like if all believers, Think about this for a moment. People that love God, I mean, I mean the real deal people, not, not casual believers, but followers of Christ. What would it look like if every time people saw our reflection, they would see the mark of God on us? What if everyone saw our image recognize that we were created in the image of God, Genesis 1, 27. What if, what if they recognized just by looking at us that we were God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, Ephesians 2, 10. What if, what if just by looking at us, they realized that the, the, those were, these are the people that are overcomers, they're more than conquerors. Romans 8, 37. What if everyone could see that we were those given the right to be called the children of God, John 1, 12? That we were those that were a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, 1 Peter 2, 9. What if people around us, everywhere on the train, on the bus, at our jobs, what if in our reflections they could tell that we were those that have been completely forgiven and made righteous, Romans 5, 1. Those that have been bought with a price, received the spirit of God, accepted, forgiven, sanctified, made holy, grafted onto the branch, part of the true vine, reconciled to God, made ministers of reconciliation, free in Christ, new creations, blessed with every spiritual blessing, temples of the spirit of God, and extensions of his glory. Romans 1, John 1, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Colossians, Galatians, book of Acts. What if everyone around us could see the mark of God on our lives? Amen. What impact would it have on the world if we were concerned with the marks that matter? And so I've been reflecting on this season that some call Lent. And and it's a season of time from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday. And, and for, I, I want it for, for this body, I want it for us to be a season of reflection. Amen? I love the thought of having a season. We've never done this before. I love the thought of having a season of preparation before the resurrection Sunday. I, I want us to approach the resurrection with the reverence that it warrants. Anybody? Can you feel where I'm coming from today? I want you to hear my heart with this. I want us to approach the the resurrection with the reverence that it warrants. It's not just another religious holiday. It's not just a day where we dress up a little and we go out to eat, a day when church attendance close to doubles everywhere in every church because people think they have to get a little religion in them that day. I hate that we see the resurrection that way. I hate that churches everywhere, we have to plan and and we have to make all these arrangements and we have all this pressure. Oh my God, Easter Sunday and all these new people. I hate that, that it becomes that when it's so much more than that. I hate that that's the mark of comfortable Christianity. Put your toes in because it's going to start to get... See, if the, all right, here it comes. If, if the body of Christ, this is my own quote, if the body of Christ lived as marked men and women, people would be following us to church every Sunday. Amen? 
if, listen, listen, if, if we, we would have prayer services where people would be waiting outside to get in, not spreading out 25 people to make it look like it's full. If the world around us saw the power within us, we wouldn't have to invite people to church. We wouldn't be able to keep them out of church. Do do you understand the power and the authority that's sitting inside of you? If the world saw that, they'd be people be following you around. People be asking you to write books. People be asking you to give advice. People be asking you for for comfort, for words, for for prayer. People will be following you around. I got a headache, touch me. I got a broken leg, touch it. I got this. I need a job, touch me. I need it, touch me. People will be pestering me because there's a power inside you. We wouldn't have to invite people to church. We wouldn't have to tell people about God. They'll be asking, tell me about the God that you're serving. Tell me about that God that's in you. Tell me why you're this. Tell me why this could happen to you and you could still smile and you could still be victorious. Tell me why people would be following us. Everywhere we turn around, there'd be be a, a mass of people in our reflection. During this season and this series, I'm going to talk about the marks that matter. And by the time we're done and, and we put on our Sunday best to come to Easter service so we can get a seat early, amen? We're going to know by that time, before that time comes, we're going to know that it would have been easier to put an ash on your forehead for a day. That it would have been easier to change your profile pic to an Arabic letter N. It would have been easier to declare what a lot of you are doing now, declaring I'm a Christian, I'm not ashamed of the gospel on Facebook in one post. What good is that if the next post you put up is going to have an F-bomb on it? What good? What good is that? What, what damage are you doing to the kingdom when you put a post that says, I am a believer of Christ, I am not ashamed of the gospel, and the next one is a booty shot? What good is that? What, what are you doing? Right? Come on, somebody's got to tell the body. Somebody, your friends ain't bold enough to tell you. I got to tell you. What good is that? Don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody, don't declare, and don't tell them you're from the sanctuary, please. (laughs) It's easier to do any of that stuff than to put on display the marks that God has called us to live by. Can we talk about those? The marks that Jesus gave us to walk in. The marks that matter. I want us as a body to enter this season as if it were something special. Because I truly believe that it is. Amen? And so I want to borrow something from this Lenten season. But definitely not all of it. So, so I need to explain it because some of you didn't go to Catholic school. Some of you don't have this background. Maybe the Lent this is the first time you're hearing of Lent. I want to explain what this is. Okay? So Lent is recognized as the season before Easter. Ash Wednesday is the start of Lent. And so people get marked with ashes on their forehead as a symbol of repentance. In ancient times, in in the Bible, we read all through the Old Testament, when somebody was in mourning, when somebody was repenting, they would put ashes on their face and sackcloth. And they would sit in ashes and sackcloth. And and it's a beautiful picture. It's saying, God, I came from dust. I'm nothing but dust. And God, I I need you. I surrender to you. It, it, It was a beautiful picture in the Old Testament. But then, and, and, and for many people today, you know, Lent is known as a time to deny ourselves. Anybody, anybody know people that tell you at work, right? Or oh, for Lent, what are you giving up for Lent? And you're looking like, I'm a Christian, what are you talking about? Right? Yeah, you guys. And, and so, and these are your like heathen, pagan, the worst guys at your job, right? They're like, yeah, what you giving up for Lent? Yo, I'm going to give up smoking. And uh, I'm giving up overeating. And I'm going to try not to curse during Lent. You're like, yo, that's effing great, bro, wonderful. And, and so people vow, people vow to give up anything to prepare them for Easter, right, right? And, 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 and so, you know, it's a time to think about your life. It's a time to think about the decisions you've been making. It's a time to reflect and repent, and that's the part that I want. That's the part that I want to take from this, from this Lent. I want it to be a time where we reflect. I want it to be a time where we repair you know, prepare. And if you know anything about, you know, people that observe Lent, you might know that for the entire season of Lent, some people don't eat meat on Fridays. How many of you? I was in, in, uh, what was that, fine, 
fine, not fine fair, that fancy one, fairway. I was in fairway. And I walked into fairway this weekend, and they have a, a sign. It says text lent to, and so if you text this number to, to, to uh, find, to, to fairway, if you text them this number, they, they text you back a coupon to save $30 if you spend $100 on seafood. Some of you are excited about that. Okay, that's not, that was, you missed the point. You missed the point. You missed the point. What I'm saying is that the world sees that the world, no, but that's a good deal. That's a good deal. Go for it. Go get your fish on. Go get it. Go to fairway. Get your fish on. But anyway, what I'm saying is they acknowledge that for Lent, a lot of people, they give up meat. On Fridays, you're doing Lent. You're not supposed to eat meat on Fridays. I got coworkers at my job. They, 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 are, they talk worse than sailors. They, they would embarrass sailors with their regular conversation. But try to give them meat on, Sunday, on Friday, they're highly offended. Oh, my God. Uh, it's Friday, puppy. <laughs> Don't you have any God in you at all? You know, you can't eat meat on Friday. You know, with a couple of F-bombs <laughs> in between that. You're like, really, dude? And so you might hear people saying, you know, I gave this up for Lent, and some people give up sweets, and some people give up, you know, something that they like, or regular, like coffee, or sugar, or soda. And I've never shared on this before, because to me, it's so, it's really hypocritical. Can I be real with you? It's like man who is dust telling God, who's the creator, I'm willing to give you this. And I know that's not really what you asked me to work on, but listen, I'm going to deny myself chocolate, and I'm going to deny myself meat on Friday, and that should be good enough for you. And I want to yell sometimes and tell people, what's the point of telling God I'm giving up meat for Lent if you're still going to be the same lying, cheating, gossiping dirtbag that you've been the whole rest of the year? What's the point? But for the next 40 days, I'm not going to eat chocolate, and that should make God happy, and that should be worth something. I'm not going to walk any different. I'm not going to make better choices. I'm not going to try to get close to you, God, but I'm giving this up for Lent, and what I'm doing is I'm giving something up to appease the God of my religion. And I'm sorry, but our God, the God of the Bible, he doesn't play with that stuff. He don't, he don't, you don't appease him with chocolate and meat on Friday. So, so listen, so what might have started out as something beautiful, something reflective, could have ended up becoming an abomination to God. Do you know, how many know the Mardi Gras? How many know about Mardi Gras? Right, you watch it on TV, I know none of you have been there. Boy. But Mardi Gras, Louisiana, you know that parade where everybody's wearing masks and you flash your boobies and you get beads, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, it's like a, everybody's drunk, twisted out their minds. You know, you're sleeping with anybody you can find. It's crazy. You know what I'm talking about. Mar- Did you know that Mardi Gras is connected to Lent and Ash Wednesday? Let me make that connection for you. Mardi Gras means Fat Tuesday. And so it refers to the day before Ash Wednesday. So Ash Wednesday, since, since, um, since Lent always starts on a Wednesday, the day before is always Tuesday, so they call it Fat or Great Tuesday because it's associated with big parties and a lot of food. Why? Because people knew that starting Wednesday, they were going to be giving up meat and they were going to be giving up all the sweets. And so back then, you couldn't, you couldn't save meat for 30 days. You wouldn't, all that stuff would go bad. And so you got together with your family. You invited your family, your friends, and you had a, a party, kind of. You know, you had a, a festival, and, and you would eat all the meat and eat all the candy. It would be like, a, you know, a nice day. And so you would have this party to, to celebrate before, ooh, Eventually, that became a day to lose all inhibitions. It eventually became a day because starting Wednesday, you were going to get religious. And so Tuesday, you got crazy as hell because you knew that the next day you were going to, you know, be, be like this religious person. Listen, look it up. Google it. The, 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 the one of the most famous dessert traditions of Mardi Gras is what? King's cake. Did, did you know that? 
Some of you knew too much about this and you're scaring me. But, let, but let's move on. So king's cake is a real sweet cake that they made with all the sugars and all the cinnamon, all the, all the stuff that they had in the house is made with all the sweets and a lot of yeast and a lot of... And so they make this batter and they make this, this like a, a strudel cake. And then they take a plastic baby, a plastic baby, and the baker, once he's done baking it, he sticks it inside the cake. And so everybody gets their king's cake and it's all good. The person that gets the Jesus, the baby Jesus in their mouth, that's the person that hosts the party for the next year. They still do it. Google it. They still, King's Cake is still the biggest delicacy in, in New Orleans, in Mardi Gras. Isn't it scary that something so beautiful as a time of reflection, as a time of being grateful for the path of Christ and thinking about the weeks before Good Friday, the suffering, the punishment, the pain, the humiliation, the torture that he would endure ultimately because of our sin, because of our rebellion, because of our unfaithfulness. Doesn't it scare you that people went into this time of reflecting and joined close to God and ended up flashing boobies for beads and wearing masks to hide their identity so that they wouldn't be accountable to the way they live that day because tomorrow we're going to be Christians because tomorrow we're not going to eat chocolate and tomorrow we're going to be set apart we're going to be marked for God on the outside Probably, probably not now anymore, but back then probably some might even go into church the next day and get ashes on their forehead and start the 40-day masquerade leading up to Easter. Let me show you what Jesus says about this kind of religion. If you look at Mark 7, He was eating with the Pharisees, and they were gathered around with the Pharisees and his disciples. And, and in Mark 7, it says, the Pharisees and, and some of the teachers of the law had come from Jerusalem, and they gathered around Jesus, and he saw some of his disciples eating food and with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. See, the Pharisees had all these ceremonial laws. They had to wash their hands all these number of times, and they had to, each utensil had to be washed a certain number of times, and all that was godly. All that was, was about being godly and about being religious, right? Verse 5, and so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? And Jesus replied, listen, listen how gangster G is right here. <laughs> Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. He, as it is written, he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are rules taught by men. You have, to let, you have let go of the commands of God and you're holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. And this is what we see today. Even, even in churches, people don't want to hear what God wants. They want to hear, they don't want his will, but they insist on his grace. And I was reading articles about this, and, and, and I, was feeling, I was feeling like, no, man, that can't be true. And then I started visiting churches and listening to their sermon titles. And everybody just wants the seven keys to set you free. The, the four ways to, to make God do what you want. The, you know, the power, how to walk in God's grace. How to, no, but there's no messages on repentance. There's no messages on, listen, your sin will doom you to hell. There's no messages on, you have to do something. You have to live a certain way. Yes, God loves you. But yes, there's a weight on that calling. Comfortable Christianity says, tell me about that amazing love that we read about in Romans, the love of Christ that if I make my bed in hell, he's there. If I go to the heavens, he's there. Nowhere can I go to hide from your love. Tell me about that love that I can't be separated from in Romans 8.37. But don't read eight, Romans 8.7. Leave that part out. The part that says that the sinful nature is always hostile to God. 
And it never obeys God's laws, and it never will. And that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. You preach that and people say, don't judge me. Don't judge me. I ain't even coming back to this church. You guys are religious and, and legalistic. I'll find me another church. Don't judge me. Only God can judge me. Look at my tattoo. <laughs> Only God can judge me. It's on my back, son. See, God has already told us what he wants from us. He's given it to us in his word. And listen, he does not want our chocolate. He does not need our money. And he doesn't care if we eat fish on Fridays. <laughs> fasting, fasting is a great spiritual practice, but it's not going to save anybody. Uh-oh. Tithing is a great spiritual practice, but you can't buy grace. God has already told us in Scripture what he wants from us. And when I read the Scriptures, the marks that matter are this. You ready? This, I'm glad nobody got up yet because this is what you need to hear, then you can leave. The marks that matter when you read to the Scriptures, the, the marks that matter are repentance, forgiveness, and love. Take that and go. Three areas of reflection that I want us to be looking at from now to Resurrection Sunday are repentance, forgiveness, and love. The first, keep going the time. I don't care. The first command, the first command of Jesus' public ministry, first thing he told anybody when he started ministering, the first thing he told anybody, you can read in Mark 1, in Matthew 4, in Matthew 12, and in Luke 13, the first thing that he told anybody, he said, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe. Repent. That was his first command to everyone. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Unless you repent, you too will all perish. Welcome to the Sanctuary Fellowship this morning. I'm glad you brought your friends. Where are our visitors at? Did they leave already? I love you guys. I'm not mad at you. I love you. I love the word. I love church. I love us. Amen? But, but, but man, we're not here to make you feel good. You know, we're not here. You, wanna, you want something to make, go get a massage or something. That'll make you feel good, you know? But church is not going to make you feel good. Church should... Ch church should, should, should to shake us out of our comfortableness. It should, it, should, right? it should bring us to some place, amen? It should comfort the afflicted, and it should afflict the comfortable. John 1, 5, 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message that we've heard and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah, rejoice, man. Come on. The repentance message is not a popular one, but without it, we have nothing. We might think we're entitled and we deserve good things. Man, I talk to people and they say, no, I'm, I'm good. You know, I'm a good, I'm a good dude. And, and, like, what do you tell somebody that says, I'm a good dude? You know, I'm a good dude. I, I don't cheat on my wife, you know, anymore. Um... Not that much, <laughs> you know? Online affairs don't count, right? No. All right, no, so I don't cheat on my wife. I don't kill nobody. I don't rape. Look at what we compare to all of a sudden. Rapists, killers, and child, and child, uh, child molesters. I don't molest kids. Wow, you're a good dude, bro. <laughs> I'm going to put you in charge of the children's ministry then. If you're, you're such a good guy, I'm going to trust you with the children's ministry. But we compare ourselves to the lowest, right? When, how about we compare ourselves to the holiness that God says that we should walk in? Now, all of a sudden, we're not that good. 
Some people think they don't have to repent. I'm a good person. The religion of this age tells people you're good enough if you do good things. If you're good, how many times have you heard this? If you're good, I weighs your bad. Like God has this measuring scale. And if you do, oh, I screwed up this week. Let me do put a couple of good things. Let me force this old lady across the street. I got you, mom. I'm going to protect you. And now that threw the balances off. So now I can lie on my taxes. <laughs> I'm stepping on toes yet? <laughs> if God is good, I love this one. If God is good and God is just and God is love, then he has to accept you and he's going to receive you. Right? But, but that's not true. That's not in the Word. That's not the Bible. If we want the God of the Bible, then the Word says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have to repent. And even after we repent and receive God, we have to remain humble and teachable. Amen? Luke 18, 9, it says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Check this out. I love when Jesus just break out a story on you. And, and, and you could try to think, well, it's not about me. He's talking about somebody else. And that's what people do in church. I know sometimes I'm preaching a message and I know it's dealing with something in your life. And I see you going, well, I know you're not talking about me. But, but, but bro, you should hear this word. <laughs> and I want to tell people, whoa, 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 don't forward this message. Listen to it again. You listen to it. Don't give it to you. Not for your husband, your cousin, your son. Your... It's for you. You were here. God knew that you were here. He spoke it to you. You're trying to pass it off to your aunt and your cousin. Amen? Look what he says. Two men went up to the temple to pray. <clears throat> One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. He said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I'm not like robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week, God, and I give you a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector, the word says, he stood at a distance. And he would not even look to heaven. He beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Verse 14, he says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified with God. For everyone who exhausts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exhausted. Church, you have to get this. The demand to repent is based on the gracious offer present to be forgiven. God doesn't want us to do something that he hasn't already provided. He doesn't ask you to step someplace to embarrass. He asks you to step someplace so that you can receive something. He says, come and repent so that you can receive forgiveness. If there were no forgiveness here for you, he wouldn't call you to repentance. If there was nothing to, to replace what you're giving up, he wouldn't call you to give it up. It's a beautiful thing about the love and the heart of God. When, when people see that, they, they know. When people see that around us, they know that there's something real. There's more than a mark on the head. There's a mark on the heart. Marks that matter. Repentance, forgiveness, and love. I want that in your head. A Christian's life is marked by forgiveness. All right, this is the uncomfortable one. A Christian's life is marked by forgiveness. I put a post the other day. It was funny. Everybody loves talking about forgiveness until they have to forgive somebody. Then all of a sudden it's that like, you don't understand what this person did to me. Right? We, when we come for forgiveness, nothing matters. I, you know, it could have done the most heinous thing. But when it comes to forgive somebody, we tell people, yeah, but you don't understand. I've forgiven him in my way. I don't ever want to see him again in my life. He's not my friend. I don't want him around my church. I don't want him around my family. I don't want him in my neighborhood. I don't want the same UPS guy that comes to my house to go to his house. That's, that's, somebody say bitterness. A Christian's life is marked by forgiveness. Pay attention, please. Don't zoom out. We only got an hour left. Matthew 6, 9. This then is how you should pray. Jesus, they asked him, how should we pray? Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Glory to your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. God, give us what we need. Give us enough for today. Give us, God, you're, you're the supplier. Give us what we need. Forgive us our trespasses. 
Forgive us those things that we've done against you, God. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us, God, everything that you can have against us. Forgive us as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive us the same way we forgive them. You realize what a dangerous prayer that is? Forgive me the same way I forgave him. If I didn't forgive him, you can't forgive me. God, that's a bad prayer, God. That's a bad, I don't like that prayer. God, just forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Give me that love that follows me from heaven to earth. Give me that love, give me that forgiveness. But don't forgive me the way I forgive him. You don't understand what he's done. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not, this is a bad verse. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you yours. Can we receive that today, buddy? Can we be mature today and receive this? This is not my preaching. This is the word of God. Amen? Look, look how much further it goes. Matthew 5, 23, he says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, if you come to praise and to lift your hands before here to worship with Ephraim and the worship team, if you come up here, listen, 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 and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front there at the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and give your gift. God, God is saying, don't even worship me until you take care of that. Like, who can worship now? Right? Who can worship? I'm, I'm scared to preach that because now this will be empty. For a season at least, maybe. Maybe the kids, the kids will come forward because they don't hold on to that stuff that we hold on to. Maybe that's why the word says we need to come to him like a child. See, Jesus considers it far more important to be reconciled to a brother than to perform a religious duty. I, I, toes are cut off. He got no feet. We're on our ankles right about now. We, Jesus says we first must be reconciled to your brother. We can't think that our service towards the Lord justifies bad relationships with others. Can I get a chair? I just got to sit down. <laughs> How do we look at ourselves? How do we look at ourselves, look at our reflection and know that I have issues that I haven't resolved, that I have no reconciliation, but I want to come to God and God sees my reflection. And in here he sees unforgiveness and he sees bitterness and he sees, he sees the stuff that I'm hiding and the stuff that I'm harboring. We're going to have this mirror up the whole month. And I'm sorry, ladies, but we're going to keep it here for a month. And then I promise it will be returned back to the sacred place in the bathroom. (laughs) But it's going to be here all month. I'm sorry. Because I want you to catch a reflection of yourself. I want you to to see that that when you come to look to God, this is what you're going to see. And so you come. this This is great. Look, check this out. You come to God, and oh, man. Wow. Wow. I didn't come here to see myself. I came here to worship God. But God says, take a look at yourself before you look at me. Wow. Wow, that that hit me harder than, than when I thought about it. Paul commanded in Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Oh, nothing bothers my whole team here more than people come in and say, I need to talk to the pastor. Come on, man. Do not be conceited. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody, if it is possible, listen, if it is possible, this is so realistic, I love that God is so real, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. 
Isn't that beautiful? See, a mark that matters, repentance, forgiveness, and love. A Christian's life is marked by repentance, forgiveness, and love. Let's get to love real quick before we close. John 13, 34. You've heard this. I preach this every other message. A new command. Jesus told his disciples, and so he's telling us, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. If there is one mark that Jesus made clearer than anything else when it comes to being marked, it was this one. He says, if, if the, by this, they'll know that you're my disciples if you can love one another. We have, we have avenues here in the Bronx where there's four churches on the same block. They can't get along with each other. And the sign says revival Monday to Tuesday, revival Wednesday to Thursday, and revival. Like God knows the Holy Spirit is only going to show up here, revival on this day, and then he's going to move over because he's on the same block. So you might as well visit this church and drop revival there Wednesday to Thursday. And then, do you realize what a joke that is? It's a joke that we can't love each other, that we can't come together. I love what we're doing now with all our sister churches, and we're, we're, we're going back and forth, and we're sharing, and we got to build a stage for Promised Land, and that's so awesome that another pastor is preaching on a stage that we helped pay for, because you guys paid for that stage, just so you know. I took some of your money. <laughs> we paid for all the wood for them, so you guys paid for that. So next time, if you're visiting, we have a prayer season over there, you say, oh, that's... That's where my money went. All right, nice, nice job. Nice job. Yeah, I paid for that. Yeah. yeah. It's so beautiful that we can be with the body and love each other and incorporate and understand that, listen, this sanctuary has a different style and it's not for everybody. And Promised Land has a different style and it's not for everybody. Harvest Field has a different style, but we love each other. We love the same God. We worship the same. And we might do it R&B. They might do it hip-hop. They might do it. But we love and, and it's all good. Amen? But, and by that, people will know that you're my disciples. If there's one mark, they'll know us by our love for one another. Watch this. Jesus 7, 17, 20. <clears throat> John 17, 20. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So, so he's praying for the disciples and then he's praying for all those that would believe through the disciples' message, so that's us. He's praying for us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. So God uses our walk to make others believe. I don't think if you've ever felt the weight of that responsibility. God uses... The fact that he's in us and we're in him and the way that we walk. And he says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Your walk is used to draw others so that people would believe. God uses our mark to get others to believe. Worship team, come on. Here's... Here's where it breaks down. Listen, here's where it all comes down to. Jesus said in Matthew 7, every healthy tree bears good fruit. Somebody say good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree can't bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. The fruit is what separates believers. The marks that matter are the fruits of the Spirit. And so my challenge to you this season, you knew the challenge was coming. You're like, get my challenge, my God. Leave me alone already. My challenge to you for today and for this season is to examine your reflection. Is it marked by repentance? Do you say, I'm sorry? Oh, this is going to start fights with husband and wives here. Fathers and daughters and sons, moms. Do you say, I'm sorry? Do you ask for forgiveness when you're wrong? Do you ever admit that you're wrong? 
That's a tough one. That's conviction. I just felt it. <laughs> Examine your, there's going to be a lot of people in denial. That's all right. We'll pray that God will convict. We can't convict. We just bring the word. Amen. Examine your reflection. Is it marked by forgiveness? Do you re release forgiveness as easily as you demand it? The word says, if you have anything against my brother, be reconciled. Be reconciled. Be reconciled. Is it marked by love? Can the people that know you see the love in you? And so what I want to do right now, if, if you're weak in any of these areas, and I mean, it's silly to even do an altar call because we should just stand right where, yeah, let's, as a matter of fact, let's do that. Don't even come down. If there's a weakness in any of these areas, if, if, if you want forgiveness, if you need to repent, if, if you, you need to, 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 to be loving, if you need to, if these aren't clearly evident in your life, or, or you might think there's some areas you need to work through, and now I believe now there's a, there's a reconciliation available right now. If we could just stand up under it right now. The fruit is the proof. The fruit is what separates. Listen, listen. Look at let's let's bow our heads for a moment. Let's bow. Let's let's close our eyes for a moment before we before we worship. Look at some of your habits. This message ain't about a Sunday thing. This is about a living life thing. Are you cynical? Are you sarcastic? Do you always gossip? Are you always talking about people? Do you always see the bad in people? Do you, do you encourage anyone? Find the one habit that hurts your relationship with God the most. And during this season of reflection, work on that. Waiting at the end of Lent is Holy Week. And it's there that all of our failings rest. It's there that all of our sin resides. It's there with the blood of Christ that we find our true comfort. It's there on the cross that we receive the greatest gift ever. Freedom for the burden that rests on our shoulders. Freedom from the sin that taints our souls. And freedom from the penalty of death as a result of all of our failings. And it's there that Christ takes them all. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. God became flesh. God is right here, right now. To receive us, to, to forgive us, to accept us. I don't want us to leave full of shame today. I don't want you to leave heavy with, with, with guilt and condemnation. That's not the intent the intent is there is a love that receives you. There is a love, a, a blood that cleanses you. There is forgiveness. There is reconciliation at the cross. But the heaviness that I want you to feel is that all of us, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory. All of us every day fall short of the glory of God and we all need the hand of God we all need the mercy and the grace of God we all need the forgiveness of God and God says if you need my forgiveness be forgiving if you need my love be loving if you want my acceptance be accepting don't leave heavy today because there's, there's nothing God says bring it to me and Take my yoke. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. Just release good, good fruit. I call out good fruit. There's a, a parable in 
that, that Jesus talks and he says he, he, the, the, the owner, the, the man comes to the owner of the farm and he says, I've come to this fig tree for three years and for three years there's been no fruit on this fig tree. Cut it down. And the farmer says, wait, wait. Give me one more year and let me dig around it and let me fertilize it. And then if after one more year it doesn't bear any fruit, you can cut it down. And I feel like some of us are right in that place where, where God, the, 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 the judgment of God is saying, cut it down. Three years, I haven't seen any fruit in this life. For, for 13 years, there's been no love from this person. For 30 years, I haven't seen any forgiveness. There's not, cut it down. And the heart of God, Jesus says, wait, give me one more year. Let me dig around this person. Let me fertilize the ground. Let me give this person everything they need to grow and to live and to bear fruit. Give them one more year. I feel like we're, some of us are right there. Give me one more year. Let this be the year that we're fruitful. Amen. Can you receive that in your prayer right now? Let this be the year that we're fruitful. God, I give you permission to dig around me. I did give you permission, God, to fertilize the ground. You know what fertilizer is? Fertilizer is dung. Sometimes God will put a lot of crap in your life. That's what the word says. And sometimes we find ourselves in a place where there's nothing but the smell and we're deep, we're deep into this dung. And it's there that God is saying, I'm loving you. I'm fertilizing the ground so that you can bear fruit, so that you have every chance available to make it. You understand the word says, I, it's my desire that none should perish. He wants all of us to be fruitful. And what a beautiful picture when we can walk through every aisle and see fruits of all different kinds. see fruits of all different kinds an abundance of fruit in the house of God that's what a church should look like as we pray as we worship let's remember this week to reflect reflect